Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. So uh, once again, welcome everybody to our uh, second week of our virtual virtual uh, Advent series. And it's lovely to have you back with us. And we had uh, some great interaction last week and we're looking forward mm -hmm. to some more this week. So uh, this week we're we're lucky to have uh, Mary Rayburn's in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, but she's online and live. So that uh, maybe you might have some other questions from on the Psalms that you didn't weren't able to ask last week. But that will be an opportunity uh, as we come uh, work our way through the materials for this week. So as we begin, uh, as we do every every week, we begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we gather today. Uh, I'm coming to you. Uh, from uh, Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation. Uh, many of us come from many different places and we, we acknowledge all our uh, elders past, present and emerging from our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. And we, we pray that we might join our dreaming with theirs as we honour the ways that our, living, our loving God has, has spoken to them. And, uh, and we pray for that time when we will come to, to honour their voice in, in our country as we should. So just invite uh, Mary Rayburn to read our Advent prayer for us this week. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness, yet seeking the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and now I'll just hand it over to David to, to welcome us on behalf of, of uh, Garrett Publishing. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, far and wide, we've got people from Melbourne to Pakistan to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, it's very early in the morning, so thank you very much to Mary Rayburn for that little bit of extra effort um, waking up in uh, uh, in the US to join us this week. Um, as usual, there's nothing for free, so I'm going to do a couple of little advertisements, but just to reinforce um, there may be accreditation available for teachers and educators um, on these sessions. So to be able to get the professional development hours for these Advent sessions, please email sales at garrettpublishing.com.au with your name, your email, ideally the same email of the Zoom registration that you have, your teacher accreditation number, um and your school name um and you can please send those details to us at garrett publishing at sales at garrett publishing and place your name and email only in the chat so we can do cross-referencing um, and therefore we may be able to get you some accreditation um, at the moment the sessions are being um considered by um max melbourne um education, Catholic education office, and um, a CECV um, as well. Um, best way to support um, YTU is not only, as Mary will do tonight, a little ad to seek donations, but please um, also support our author's works if you haven't already. So they've produced some fantastic books for us and they continue to produce some fact, uh, fantastic books for us as well. So Chris's See With the Eyes of the Heart, as I mentioned last week, is a fantastic gift um, uh, for yourself or for any of your loved ones. And it will give you some inspiration, some reflections that you can use through Advent or indeed throughout the whole year. Um, we've got the next one, um, 
Yanina's Women in the Old Testament um, Friendly Guide um, is really a fantastic book. Um, so if you'd like to know, learn more about um, women in the Old Testament and get a more of Yanina's flavour, um, then that's the book for you. Um, Chris, I think we move on to the Book of Psalms, the Friendly Guide to the Book of Psalms, which Mary Rayburn kindly did and we released earlier in this year. And again, it's a wonderful way to open up the Psalms in such a friendly, inviting mm -hmm. and informative way. We've got um, Mary Collo. I could, I could promote many, many Mary's books because she's done so many of them. Um, over the journey for us at Garrett Publishing. So the birth of Jesus um, is obviously the most timely. Um, uh, um, and so, again, if you really want to open up the infancy narratives, um, uh, then that's the book for you. And I think there's uh, and a book that we encourage people to buy every year is Daily Prayer. Um, so every day it looks at the gospel readings gives you some reflections, some discussion points, um, and some prayers um, as well. So we think that's a fantastic title for your spiritual journey for 2023, which kicked off the new liturgical year on Sunday. Chris? Yep, thank you, David. So, uh, it's now able, we're able to move along to Yanina and uh, invite you to... Uh, well, welcome us into the, the first reading for this uh, coming Sunday. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, David. And thanks to all of you who came again this week. So this week's reading is again from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 11, 1 to 10. The reason or one reason why we have readings from Isaiah during Advent um, and you will see all four readings are from Isaiah, is that in Isaiah there are a number of texts that can be read as announcing a or the Messiah. Now, one such text is precisely um, this one, Isaiah 11, 1 to 9 or 1 to 10. Um, in the reading, it's 1 to 10. It's important, though, to keep in mind that Every prophetic oracle is announced first and foremost to its own context, its own time. The problem with this particular text is that there are a lot of different opinions about when it was written. So it's not that straightforward in this case. But let's see if we can understand something of it or with it, um, regardless of that. So let's look at what comes just before, for example. So immediately before this passage, so stepping a chapter back, if you want, um, we find the image of God felling Judah's enemies, and perhaps Judah as well, like tall trees. So when we come into chapter 11, the implication is that Judah and its monarchy, its kings, have been cut like a tree and only a stump is left. And that's exactly when we start reading that a shoot shall come out from the stump and a branch shall grow out of its roots. So whatever situation um, the writer was in, it's one of crisis. And this, um, this oracle is one of hope. So Jesse, obviously, I'm sure many of you know, is the father of King David. So the, the shoot coming out from the stump will be another Davidic king, another king in the line of David. I've put this verse I've put from the NRSV, and after that, I used the same translation as in the lectionary, but I've turned it all into future tense because that's more appropriate the translation. I don't know when the lectionary is all present tense. It's actually a future. Um, so a should will come out or shall come out. It's not there yet. It's something you need to hope for. So what kind of king is Isaiah talking about? The first thing we learn about this king is 
that on him the spirit of God shall rest, a spirit of wisdom and insight or understanding, a spirit of counsel and power, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. If this list sounds familiar, um, it should. <laughs> it's a very, um, there are very significant words. So let's have a bit of a look. Um, in the first book of Samuel, chapter 16, the spirit of the Lord comes mightily or rushed onto David as he is anointed by Samuel to be king. In the first book of Kings, King Solomon is giving a wise and understanding mind or heart. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom personified has counsel, understanding, and power. And in the book of Job, God has wisdom, power, understanding, and counsel. So these are just examples. I could put others. Just to show you that these words are very evocative, very significant. This shoot, this king, um, has very important attributes that make him, um, that link him with the wisdom tradition of, of the Bible. Knowledge also um, here, this knowledge doesn't um, refer to, you know, a good education, knowledge, things that you know, but it's knowledge of, of God is a synony a synonymous to fear of the Lord in a way or very similar. Um, and also fear of the Lord um, is not fear as in being afraid of God, but a sense of awe and respect towards God, which then, so both the knowledge of God and the fear of the Lord lead to a, um, some author called it socially responsible behavior. So because you fear God, you, you respect God, you hold, you hold God in awe, you lead a good life, good in the sense of doing good things. So this is what this king is uh, going to be. What does he do? He will not judge by appearances and give no verdict or will make no decision on hearsay. But he shall judge the wretched, the poor, with integrity and with equity give a verdict for the poor of the land. His word shall be a rod that strikes the ruthless, and his sentences shall bring death to the wicked. Integrity shall be the loincloth around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his hips. Also there, you could, you could talk forever about, <laughs> about this text. I just rushed through. Um, you, you might have noticed that there are two verbs that get repeated. Judge, here yeah. and there, and give a verdict or make a decision. So they relate to courtroom judgment, like the, the king is a judge, um, arbitrating between um, parties in, in, that have an argument among them. But it also um, refers to government more in general. So the person we're talking about will make the right decisions because the spirit of God is going to guide him like a GPS. He's got, you know, Google Maps in his mind and he knows what's the right thing to do. And there will be justice even for the poor, even for those who have no um, means to, to fend for themselves. After this, the scene suddenly changes. From verse 6 onward, we suddenly find ourselves outdoors and surrounded by animals and small children. In a very peaceful scene that has inspired artists, songwriters, and, and other people for centuries. Um, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the panther or leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion cub shall feed together with a little boy to lead them. The cow and the bear, or she bear, shall make friends, and their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The infant shall play over the cobra's hole. Into the viper's lair, the young child shall put its hand without being harmed, obviously. So, beautiful scene. Um, the, the striking thing is that all these wild beasts that are mentioned here, leopards, lions, bears, and all that, normally would put great danger 
or present serious danger to the domestic animals mentioned, kids and lambs, and even more so to, to, to children or to human beings in general. Instead, these beasts, these animals, are perfectly tame. They're part of the flock. So the calf and the lion cub feed together. The lion cub's part of the, of the herd, part of the, part of the cattle. And a young child can lead them or guard them with no problem because there is no danger anywhere. There are no wild animals to attack because they don't attack. They are part of, part of the flock. And even poisonous snakes pose no threat at all. There is no danger. There's a world without danger. So what's behind this image and how does it connect to the one of the king just before? Again, there is a lot of debate and a lot of different opinions. Um, for example, many commentators say that it refers back to an old myth about an ideal state of harmony at the beginning of creation that then got ruined by sin and other things and, and that will be restored at some point. So that could be. It's not a myth that explicitly is present in, in Genesis, but could be there are um, others in, in the surrounding cultures. But others, and that's one I, I picked to, to tell you about, um, others point out that the focus in the scene isn't so much among, about peace among the animals. It's about the safety and security for the human beings. So no flock will be lost, no cattle will be lost to wolves or lions because they are tame. No child will be harmed by them because they are tame. In some other prophetic texts, wild animals are portrayed as a danger either to do with curses or wild animals are used as a kind of metaphor for dangerous humans. For example, don't get scared here. Um, in Isaiah, in a few chapters earlier, Isaiah 5, an invading army is compared to a pack of lions who come and take and no one can rescue what they have taken. In Ezekiel in chapter 22, um, corrupt leaders of Jerusalem are compared to man-eating lions and to wolves that attack and that do that for, um, or for their own gain. So they attack human beings. So these are just two examples. But the, the thing that I found interesting is if we take the lions and wolves and bears in Isaiah 11 as metaphors for human predators, like for example, Roberts does, this explains or makes it easier to see how the two parts of the oracle work together. Because then, this is again, this um, scholar Robert saying that then the new kings just rule. That's what puts an end to the abusive force that is inflicted by those who are violent and evil on the innocent and harmless. So the, the lions and the bears and the wolves, the bad people, aren't going to inflict any harm on others because either the king judges them and puts them away or they convert because it's no point being evil and they eat straw like an ox even though they are a lion. The point of all this is that justice and good governance will bring about a peaceable society. That's the vision. Then verse 9, which is very beautiful, sums it up and links back to verse 2, saying, they will do no hurt, no harm on all my holy mountain. It's God speaking. For the country or the land or the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters swell the sea. So not only the king will have knowledge of God, but the whole country or the whole land or the whole earth, it would all be the same word in Hebrew, is full of knowledge of God the same way as the sea is full of water. So everyone will have knowledge of God. And then verse 10 just opens it up to a wider scope 
Um, so it will be a signal to the peoples and a sign to the nations. So not just um, God's country, um, not just God's holy mountain, but everyone um, has to see that and, and be attracted by it. Now, of course, the problem is that no king ever would be able to live up to these expectations and no other ruler or person in responsibility either. So these, these um, images are exaggerated and, um, and are idealized. Some prophecies are just, we might say, too good to come true, but they're also too beautiful to be ignored. So what do you do? What happens? One thing that happens is that they get pushed further and further into the future. Oh, well, now this king didn't quite make it, but maybe the next one. Or maybe maybe Cyrus, maybe the Maccabees, maybe. Or maybe at the end of time, God will look after it and God will send us his anointed one, the Messiah. And then that will bring about this peaceable society. Isaiah 11 was read in a messianic key already before Christianity, but then, of course, the early Christians, the patristic, the, the fathers of the church, medieval theologians read it in a Christological um, note or like as if like portraying Jesus. And that's where we get um, um, the innumerable um, artworks of the tree of Jesse from our Jesse tree. Um, there are many, many, many examples all over the place um, in, in Europe, but not only. So you have always Jesse at the bottom sleeping, being dead, and a tree growing out of him with often David, then there's Mary somewhere, and on the top there's Jesus. He is Jesus enthroned, on this example it's Jesus on the cross. But it's the continuity of um, the old and, and the new covenant, if you want. It's an art form, or it's a, a motif that has that was very popular in, in art in the Middle Ages. Now, what about us? So in Advent, we wait for the Messiah to appear and for God to change the world. But then, as I was preparing this, I thought, hang on, wait a minute. Haven't we all received in our baptism and confirmation, those same gifts of the spirit of the Lord as does as this messianic king. That list, when I, before when I said, does it sound familiar? It should because the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit come from that list among, our, among other places. Wisdom, counsel, um, knowledge, um, or all of these things. Don't we have those? Don't we have to some degree knowledge of God? And entering more deeply into the word of God, like we are doing just right now, nourishes that. So what do we do with it? Maybe a good Advent question that we could ask ourselves this week, that I'm asking myself after doing this, is where and how can we use those gifts that God gave us, our wisdom, our counsel, our sense of all, our what we know, how can we use that to bring about a little bit more peace around us? We are not kings. We don't rule over a country, but we all have some influence on other people. Then, of course, the theme of peace and justice continues over into the psalm. So they're really nicely collect, connected both last week and this week. So this is where I hand on to Mary Raven. Thank you. Let's stop sharing. Thank you, Yanina. Yes, they do. They connect very, very well. The um, as I usually say, the the psalm links the first reading and the gospel very well, and it does again uh, for this coming Sunday of Advent. So we have um, the refrain for the psalm, when justice flourishes, and there's something of that invitation as we enter into this Advent season. So the, the shoot of Jesse, the offspring of Jesse, will 
ideally introduce a time where the wolf, wolf lives with the lamb, where we have that harmony that Yanina spoke about so beautifully. Uh, our psalm is a prayer for a just and, if you like, perfect ruler. Uh, in Romans, um, part of that harmony is that all will give glory to God. And then in Matthew, we have John the Baptist pointing to Jesus as introducing that, uh, that harmony. And the early Christian community learned that that wasn't fully realized in the first coming of Jesus. And so we, we wait for that second coming of Jesus. And sometimes Jewish friends will say to me, you say the Messiah has come, but we don't see this uh, perfect harmony that the Messiah is to introduce. And my reply is usually that that's what we're waiting for with the second coming of Jesus. And maybe there will be similarities in terms of our messianism then. So our Psalm, Psalm 72 is a prayer. It's a prayer, it's addressed to God asking for blessings upon the king. And perhaps even more importantly, it indirectly asks for the good for the people over whom this king will reign. Because when there is a good king or a, a very good king, uh, the king introduces harmony into the life of the people and takes care of those who are most vulnerable. This psalm may speak of an ideal king who will bring justice and attend to the needs of the marginalized and the needy. And the people desired a king who would make justice flourish, who would make harmony flourish, who would introduce uh, that, that time that Isaiah speaks of. Um, and we all long for that. We, we look at the, the news on television and we long for that time. And they were longing for it right back then and praying for it, praying that maybe the next king would introduce that reign in their lifetime. So the psalm has two different foci, you know, in a way, in that it could be... Um, a, an ideal king that they're awaiting, or it could be a prayer at the inauguration of a new king, hoping that this king will be the one to introduce that ideal time. And the Jewish scholar Siegel has, in speaking of this psalm, called it one of the earliest proposals that a state, any state, any nation, will be judged by its care for the poor. So this psalm is um, political in many ways. I'm not talking party politics, but it's political. It's about the use of power in many ways by the king to introduce justice and the fullness of peace forever, as the refrain says. If the prayer is for a real current king, uh, a new king, then we would call it a royal psalm. If it's about an idealized future king, then we would categorize it as a messianic psalm. So we, our expectations of a text shape the way we categorize it, and, and we really need to be aware of that. But the refrain is what is repeated, and the refrain is what in a way sums up the whole thing, that this future king or this newly inaugurated king, the hope of the people is that this king will introduce justice which flourishes in his time and fullness of peace forever. And so we, we understand then that the context of Advent shapes the way we hear this psalm because we're hearing it in terms of the person of Jesus. Just to concentrate a little on the second half of the refrain, it talks about fullness of peace, shalom. And we usually translate that peace and 
rightly so, but it's not simply peace as an absence of war. It's about the full flourishing and welfare and wholeness initially of, of the humans who are part of that. But today we even expand that further and we long for the full flourishing of the whole of our planet Earth. We include that in, in that longing that the refrain gives expression to. So here on this Psalm, I have on this side, the portions of the Psalm, which are used in the responsorial Psalm. And then on the, the other side, I have the whole Psalm. And you can see the way uh, the blue part here is paralleled, the tan orangey part paralleled here, the green part here, and then the pink part. And the, the white parts in between on this side are the parts that are left out. And they are the parts that um, may be less attractive once we're in the liturgical context and we're trying to shape the psalm to talk about Jesus because the psalm is much older than the coming of Jesus. Um, so we, we just need to be aware of how we, how our liturgical context really shapes the texts we use. I think we could pray this, this psalm, um, the whole psalm, or even the, the partial form in the responsorial psalm for our political leaders today. I think that could be a, a beautiful way to proceed in this time where we are longing for that new, um, new state of harmony. So this Psalm written long before Jesus in the context of Advent and in the context of the other readings is shaped to point towards Jesus. Um, whose rule is not yet fully realized and we await it expectantly. So in Advent, as we await the coming of Jesus, whose reign will manifest care for all who are vulnerable, including our earth, I, I think it's important that we share in that longing for the perfect time, but the, also that we contribute to it ourselves. That, for me, is the call of Advent. We can't fix everything. Even if we were an ideal king, we probably couldn't fix everything, but we can do some things. And so these are uh, my suggestions, if you like, of what we can contribute. We have a certain responsibility this Advent to care for the most vulnerable while we await Jesus' coming. Maybe we can pray Psalm 72 for world leaders that they too may care for the most vulnerable. We can pray with Jesus for the coming of such a kingdom at a time that at least is more harmonious than the time we witness at the moment. We can care for our tiny planet Earth as it too knows a period of great vulnerability. And we can act to ensure that justice shall flourish in his time, the, the time of Jesus's second coming, but also that it will flourish in our time and fullness of peace forever. And then there may be other responsibilities to which you wish to respond in this time. So it's a time of longing. It's a time when we recognize that justice is not yet fully established and that peace is not fully flourishing, but we long for and contribute to that time. Thank you.
Okay, that's terrific. So it's interesting to see the, the way these these themes have been interlocking uh, in our readings. And I suppose it shouldn't shouldn't surprise us, given the fact that the, the church has carefully chosen the readings that we have for Advent. So uh, the reading that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, Romans 15, 4 to 9. So that particular text comes to us um, from the end of the, the letter to the Romans. So you, maybe just a little bit of background information about uh, the letter. Uh, Paul did not write it, the letter to the Romans. Uh, it was the community was founded by other Christians. Uh, he meets up with Aquila and Prisca or Priscilla when they expelled with other Jewish um, people from from Rome in 49 AD in the time of the Emperor Claudius. Um, because there was there were battles with, about a, a person called Christus, which you imagine is actually talking about Christos, Jesus. So when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to a community, interesting enough, that is um, a long way from Shalom. I, th I think we've got the ideal vision there in Isaiah, then we've got the Psalm that Mary has been speaking about. And then today, we actually come to a community that is quite divided. And, and Paul, in, in fact, many of the Many of his of his efforts in, in the whole context of the letter is to actually get Gentile and uh, Jewish Christians in their household churches in Rome to be able to live in peace with one another. So there's problems in paradise, if you like. So in Rome, the community was divided between Jewish and Gentile Christians who had become intolerant of one another. Uh, you know, we know what happened in Corinth when Paul had saying, look, um, some are saying I'm for Paul, some I'm for Paulus, I'm, I'm for Peter, Kephas, I'm for Jesus. Um, so it's, it's probably encouraging in a way for us to realise that even in, in the early years of the Christian movement, uh, people were not in shalom with one another. There were divisions, there were um, misunderstandings, there were sometimes lack of trust for one for the other. And so we know that there are factions among the household churches. If you have a look at Romans 16, you'll have a, an opportunity to see some of the, the names of the different household communities there in Rome. So from what we can pick up from the letter, um, Gentile Christians accused Jewish Christians of following an outmoded religion. Um, and Jewish Christians accused the Gentile Christians of lacking respect for the fact that Jesus and the first disciples were Jewish. So uh, Yanina has already spoken in terms of the Jesse tree and continuity, uh, but we know like for the, the Gospel of Mark, um, that this continuity was very strong. Uh, it was written largely for a Gentile community and the tradition has it was written in Rome. Um, we, may, we, we can't be totally sure about that, but we, we can see that there's this movement in the, in the Gospels uh, to deal with a Gentile future. It looks like what one of the things that was going on in Rome is the Gentile Christians had, um, when, when Jewish Christians had been expelled from the city, Gentiles Christians came in. They weren't going to be a trouble to the Roman authorities because they weren't fighting with, with the Jewish community. They grew, but eventually Jewish Christians came back to the city. And that's where the problem started. So Jewish Christians suggested that everyone follow the Jewish practices, particularly for admission into this, uh, into this messianic movement because Jesus was the Messiah. So they were wanted to impose circumcision, uh, following the purity code and dietary laws. We see this in a number of Paul's letters. We see it in, in Corinth, we see it in Philippians, we see it in Galatians, and we see it um, in a less volatile way in the letter to the Romans. So the Gentiles, for, on their part, replied that they could see no reason to follow these practices coming from a people who had rejected and crucified their own Messiah. You can get a bit of a feel for the, the, the tensions that were there within the community, and that leads Paul to write the letter that he does. And because one of the things he's going to actually say in the first three chapters of the book of Rome, or letter to the Romans, is that whether you're a Gentile or Jew, all of us need Jesus and we've got to make room for one another. So other questions have come along. Some didn't respect the Old Testament saying that it was outmoded and no longer relevant for Gentiles. 
So we can see Paul has a number of challenges that he has to deal with in coming uh, to the reading that we have in chapter 15 for this week. So our passage today, Paul is going to be arguing that unity will bring peace. Uh, so it comes from the concluding section of the letter. And when Paul is working for peace among those divided Christians, he wants to give them hope in God and in each other. I suppose this is one of the things, isn't it, that we've got in the first reading from Isaiah, a hope for a, for a united humanity, a, a shalom within the community, in the world. Um, and if, if, uh, if Isaiah was talking about uh, having people who were not going to be rulers who were dominating, who, who were respectful, who gave just judgment, imagine what it felt like for these Roman Christians surrounded by all the might and power of Rome. So we'll take a passage by passage through what we've got for today. So everything that was written long ago in the scriptures was meant to teach us something about hope from the example the scripture gives of how people who did not give up were helped by God. So one thing that you may not know is that Paul makes extensive use of the Old Testament, the First Testament, in his letters. So just in terms of Romans alone, he makes use of many texts. He cites the Psalms 13 times. He cites the Pentateuch 22 times. Uh, he, he cites the prophets 24 times, and Isaiah is definitely his favourite. Uh, the book, first book of Kings and Job. So we can see Paul is drawing on his own tradition to try and draw these uh, Christians, be they Gentile or, or Jewish, together. So Paul takes this, this line. He says, look, while some of you are unsure about the ongoing validity of the scriptures, he's saying they have an ongoing work because they have much to teach us about hope. And you might be interested to learn, and we can't possibly go into all the, all the texts in Paul about hope, but Paul has an enormous number of texts, probably more texts on hope than anyone else in the New Testament. So I thought I'd just get a couple of texts from Romans itself just to give you uh, a, a sample of that. So therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, Yanina has already pointed out um, what the vision of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that um, the New Testament or the church has taken over from Isaiah. Another text later on in Romans, a beautiful chapter. Um, chapter 8 is an extraordinary um, witness, I think, to how the early Christians saw themselves in a, in a world that was groaning to give birth, huh? uh, and as we, we long for peace in our world, in the midst of all the anxieties and stresses and strains of our world, we wonder where is God in the midst of this, and how, how is God at work? Well, Paul, part of Paul's response is that we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now, and not only the creation, that we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So for Paul, the gift of the Spirit was a, a guarantee that God would be faithful to God's promises and that Jesus would return. So we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, redemption of our bodies. And certainly I think this is a, 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 sens a sensation and experience that, that most of us have somewhere along the line, maybe many times in our lives. Longing for the world to be more peaceful, longing to be more at peace in ourselves, longing to be the Christian that we're called to be. One of the things that Paul reminds us now, for in hope we were saved. It's not just our hope. It's God's hope in us. Because God always opens a new possibility, always graciously gives us an opportunity to begin, ahead, to begin again. 
So where were we in the meantime? Well, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it. Wait for it. We're all called to do that. So Paul goes on in our reading for next Sunday. And may he who helps us when we refuse to give up, help you all to be tolerant with each other, following the example of Christ Jesus, so that united in mind and voice you may give glory to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This idea of being tolerant with one another, being actually sources of consolation for one another. So Paul sees it in a very interesting way and it picks up on what we've, the challenge that Mary has already put, for us, uh, put before us today about it's not just what God is doing, but what are we doing? So for Paul, Christian hope leads to tolerance and it leads to care for those who are different to us. And we can see the church is really battling with that in these days. Mm-hmm. Being tolerant, not just being politically correct, but actually making room for everybody. So there's no room for thinking only about our personal salvation. So holiness without wholeness is not holiness at all. It all has to be put into right relationship. So one of the ways that Paul deals with the the visions within the community, he takes an image from life. He uses the image of the olive tree and we just know how how significant uh, the olive, the fruit, uh, and the oil that it produces, how significant it is for the Mediterranean. So he says, look, the people of Israel are like an olive tree, but it's an olive tree that's not being bearing the kind of fruit that it should. So what do you do? You get a graft and you put it in. But the graft won't take unless there's life coming from the root, from, from the branches. And so Paul is trying to dynamically invite all of the community to be tolerant of one another. Because Paul is going to say, the blessings you receive in having Jesus as your Messiah, you receive because of Israel. So respect your fellow Jewish Christians. And the Jewish Christians are reminded, yes, well, the Messiah did come, and many of you did not accept him. So this is too is part of God's plan to bring in the Gentiles. So one of the things that Paul talks about is following the example of Christ. And I thought one of the places uh, where Paul articulates this most clearly is in Philippians. Those first verses before we get that beautiful text that him, though his state was divine, he did not cling to his equality with God. But he empties himself and becomes as we are. So before that him, and we don't know whether Paul wrote it or whether it was part of the, the, the community there in Philippi, He says this, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So this is the kind of challenge that Paul is putting before the Christians of Rome. He says, it can only be to God's glory then for you to treat each other in the same friendly way as Christ treated you. I thought, hmm, I was pretty sure the Greek didn't say friendly way. So it it got me just uh, doing a little bit more examination of that. So when Paul speaks of treating each other in a friendly way, it means to welcome another into your home or to take them along with you. So for the divided Roman Christian households, this was a call to hospitality and to acceptance, to take each other along for the journey. And because they were divided households, because the purity code, some in terms of what one community was eating or one household was eating and the other not, they were not, you know, they were not comfortable in being with one another. So Paul makes it very practical for them. Make room for each other in your homes. 
And Paul draws a lot of his arguments together in the letter. The reason Christ became the servant of, of the circumcised Jews was not only so that God could faithfully carry out the promises made to the patriarchs, it was also to get the pagans to give glory to God for his mercy. The scripture says in one place, For this I shall praise you among the pagans and sing to your name. So for Paul, the promises made to Abraham and Sarah that all the nations would be blessed through them are now coming to fulfilment. And what you need is a new compass. Mm. So what about us? Well, what are your hopes this Advent in our wounded and divided world? How tolerant are we of differences? How open are our homes and hearts? And what might it mean for you to follow the example of Christ, this Advent. Have you to Mary? Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, second Sunday of Advent. You notice it's Matthew chapter 3, but this actually begins the gospel story. The story begins, of course, with John. And the first two chapters of Matthew I'll talk about later in this series, which focus on the child, the infant, as the focus. They're really introducing the adult Jesus. So the reading for this coming Sunday. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan and they were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you in water for repentance, but one more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptise you in the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, last week, I hope you remember that I spoke about the strong sense of expectation in Judaism in that first century. Things are so bad, they can't get any worse. And therefore, God must be coming to save us very soon. This is the idea that lies behind John's proclamation. The kingdom of heaven has come near. This was John's conviction. And he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. Isaiah was preaching at a similar time when Israel felt completely defeated. Surely now God will act. John's preaching attracted crowds. He had a strange appearance and he had the manner of one of the ancient prophets. So people were curious. John calls out, repent. Have a change of heart. Time is running out, so take God seriously. So 
this is the message. This is the message. Take God seriously. He then speaks to part of the crowd. Now, the Pharisees and Sadducees were not wicked. They weren't bad people. They were very religious people. And the Pharisees were a bit like me and Janina, Mary. They were lay people serious and fascinated with the scripture and wanting to be teachers. The Sadducees were more aligned with the priesthood and its temple cult. They too hear the strong criticism of John, you brood of vipers. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were like the official religious people. And John attacks them for being self-righteous. You know, they sort of puff their chests out and say, we have Abraham as our father. We have God on our side. John thinks differently. It's not keeping the letter of the law or practicing worship perfectly that counts. What counts is one's goodness, one's inner real goodness and it's a goodness that people recognize a goodness that bears fruit in action things like care of others generous hearts looking out for the most vulnerable this is goodness john asks people to step into the waters of the jordan but he speaks of another who will invite people into the life of the spirit. And this one can see into the hearts of people to know their true goodness or not. And John uses the image of dividing the grain into the seed, the good kernels to be saved, and the worthless chaff to be tossed away. You know, I often wonder about John. If John turned up in my church this Sunday, what would we make of him? Would we smile at his delusion? Be embarrassed by him? Be angered that he's upsetting our normal religious routines? We might say, you've got to be kidding. Give more taxes to help the vulnerable? No way. Oh, he's not living in a real world. You see, John's questions cause discomfort. And if John caused discomfort in his time, so much that he was thrown in prison and executed, John preaches the coming of God. Nothing about him is attractive. The environment is the harsh Judean wilderness. His clothes and food are bizarre, and his message, repent, is hardly an advertising slogan. And yet, people come to him from Jerusalem, Judea, and the whole of the Jordan district. You see, even though John looks weird, people recognize truth. It may not be attractive. Some may prefer to avoid it, but we can't fully hide from the truth. John speaks to the truth of God. God is near. God is coming. Is your life open to receive God or not? This takes us into some of the words John used. When we hear the word baptism, we may immediately think of the Christian ritual of baptism. But the word in Greek simply meant to immerse, to plunge into water. And within Judaism, it was a very common ritual. Archaeologists have found many bathing pools in some of the houses in Jerusalem and many at the entrance of the temple. The one on the right is from Qumran, the community by the Dead Sea. 
These bathing pools are called mikvah, or in the plural, mikvot. Before going into the temple, pilgrims would firstly totally undress, then submerge themselves under the waters. There were some for women and some for men. Priests who lived in Jerusalem would have their own mikvah in their own home and carry out this ritual every day before serving in the temple. It was an inner cleansing, an outer cleansing symbolizing an inner cleansing in preparation for God. The early followers of Jesus, who were Jews and so familiar with this ritual, used this plunging beneath water as their ritual of commitment, their ritual for initiation into the community. Another word, translated as repent, means something like change your whole way of being, change your heart, hence the picture of a heart transplant. John doesn't go into detail of how to do this. Instead, a heart transplant is left to each individual. All John asks for is a true change of heart. This is why he's critical of the Jewish religious leaders who are presented here as just going through the motions. They want the waters of baptism without doing the hard work of seeking and living out the truth in their lives. Rituals are easy. Truth seeking costs. As we prepare yet again for, for the celebration of God's coming, may we approach it at the level of our hearts, even if that calls for some changes. Wheat and chaff. Have you all be already begun the mad Christmas rush? Can you see yourself in the image at the right? But I wonder, is it really necessary? If you are really too busy, will you ever have time to pause, to let God catch up with you? During this time leading up to Christmas, Perhaps we could take up Paul's advice and find some time, some space to stop, to be quiet, perhaps to read the gospel of the Sunday, reading it slowly and prayerfully, seeing a word that would help your own life. In what way could you prepare for the Lord in your family, in your life? If when you stop, you feel as if you're in a wilderness. Don't worry about that. Remember the words of Isaiah. The wilderness blossoms. Can you invite the power of the Holy Spirit into your life this Christmas? Take a risk and invite God in. Now the ads. I thought I'd um, make it even more, more poignant tonight with the begging bowl. So contribute if you can. That's the name of the our account and the BSB and the account number. And a reminder that um, we're open for enrolments for next year. So come and join us. Sit in Yanina's classes or Mary's, Chris's, face-to-face, -face, online. And reminder that we do welcome auditors as well as students. Auditors are people who come to classes but don't do the assessment. So thanks for your participation tonight and your support. Okay, Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mary. That's terrific. Thank you. Right. Well, I wonder if there's any um, questions for us. So I saw one earlier on for, for Mary Rayburn, um, and it was about how do you feel when they, when um, the, the liturgy cuts up? The, well, I think we can guess what you might say about that. 
I I I understand that it's it's important at times because the psalm can't be too long. And I mean, if we had Psalm 119, which is the longest one, there would be no time for the other readings. So I I understand that liturgy has certain requirements. And yet I always um, I always have a little moan when they cut the psalms up. So I I think what my compromise is that I read the whole psalm beforehand and then listen to the the parts during the liturgy. Fair enough. And I think it's fair enough to say, though, that um, that, that experience of text being split up happens for uh, readings from the prophets and from from Paul and the Gospels too. And, and of course, we, we're always naturally drawn to what are the parts that they didn't include? And oftentimes for us, they're the, they're the, they're the fun parts, you know, aren't they? Yeah. Chris, um, David, and I don't think it was you, David, from Gary no. Publishing. David no. asked... I, I think, don't need to ask intelligent questions. <laughs> well, this, is, this is an intelligent question uh, and uh -huh. it's a very rich question. Is it possible to understand the text? He's referring to the text from Isaiah, Janina, as not only referring to our outer life, but our inner life. Our inner wolf will lie down with our inner lamb in the presence of God. Is the longing for harmony and in, an inner longing for harmony in ourselves with all the parts of ourselves? So I made a quick response, but I welcome uh, responses, mm -hmm. Janine, Mary, Chris. But I wrote this. I said, hi, David. When I, that's all I can say, when I take up a text in prayer, I do read the images as symbols. I take them internally. So my wolf, struggling with my lamb, that's how I read it prayerfully, as my seeking for harmony. I don't think this sort of almost psychological insight was part of Isaiah's plan, but it is a very rich way of praying using the scriptures hmm. to exegete them. You know, that's what we do in our work. But when I sit down to pray, I enter into them in whatever imaginative way I can. Others? Yeah, I, I think that's right, uh, Mary. I think it's, it, draws, it draws us to a really important part is that um, there are multiple ways of reading the scriptures. And I think we're already talking in terms of the world behind the text, the world in the text, the world in front of the text. And I think probably the most one of the most important things to do is actually not confuse the readings or those different mm -hmm. ways of reading a text. Know what you're doing at the different times because a person might be reading a text and say, "Oh, this is the you know like modern literary theory might say, "Yeah, look, it's it's the performance of what what happens is me is the only thing that happens." But of course, the, the trouble about that is then we're not paying any, we're not involved in a conversation with with Isaiah or the psalmist or or John or Paul or Matthew or Luke, where we're just sort of drawing it as, as, as though it didn't come from a world and we're not paying respect to um, to the person or persons that wrote them and preserved them for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great. So, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, of course you can read it um, that way, uh, David and, and anyone else. Um, and and of and I and there, there's great riches in that, as as Mary mm -hmm. just said, and also Chris. The the thing with prophetic texts, though, is they are always not just one person. They are always pointing to a society or to to several people, to a group, country, or whatever whatever group you want to imagine. Um, so it's not. It's it's also your inner harmony and your inner, and I like that I, I can see I can imagine the whole whole lot of <laughs> happening in me um, and it, 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 it would be very rich to explore but that harmony within me that I long for I long for that also because with that in me I can create harmony among the people I am with because if I'm I don't have harmony within me I'm not going to create much peace outside of me usually 
So, so it's both. Um, it's a call within ourselves, but it's also always looking outward and seeing what what happens there. Um, sometimes we tend to maybe um, condition by by our society to see things in an individualistic way. Often the Bible has more. Uh, there's a group. There's Special. not just me. Mm. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. No. yeah. Communion, yes, that, that mm -hmm. would be the word. I, I think that's really true, Yanina. I think the 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 communal feel that you get from well, especially the First Testament, but also from the New Testament, mm -hmm. it, it belongs to a society which was much more aware of the community to which it belonged. Mm -hmm. We we do live in an age which is more. That, that the harmony can't be about internal harmony as well. But I, I think there's always, we need to hold both because we live within a society. Mm. Thanks, Mary. Mm. Thanks. Uh, that, that's right. We've got a, um, one last question there about gurus. Well, I hope to let, that's all of us, great, very good. Um, prior to International mm. Post, how might Paul's letters and other extracts of scripture made their way to the different communities. Yes, well, um, in, in terms of Paul's letters, uh, if we read Paul's letters, he's already got at least 35 people that are mentioned in them who are co-workers and, and people who take the letters from one, from one mm. community to another. So there was an mm. extraordinary, quickly um, developing network of relationships. And if we look at the Didache, which is first century or second century writing, we can see there were a lot of wandering um, missionaries or, or preachers or apostles, um, so called, and, and so they were. They were. I mean, developing. It, it was. It was going gangbusters because, like Paul was saying in Romans, look, if I, how can people say Amen unless someone brings the message? And so, very, very quickly, mm. they were establishing and networks and resources. And yeah, it, it's quite, quite amazing how widespread. Uh, you know, when, and when you talk to people, um, if you think about um India, uh, the traditions linking Sarah Malabar right to, to Thomas and, and otherwise. They they moved around, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. like, like the Coven Co coaches. Yeah, yeah. It passed on and on and on. <laughs> I reckon the the unsung heroes of the New Testament, certainly in the letters of Paul, are the people who actually delivered his letters and actually had to sell them to the communities at the other end. Uh, here it is. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Run for your life, you know. Yes. Yeah. Don't read it. I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm very conscious of time. Yeah, we're, 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 indeed. Yes. Thank you, David. It is quarter past, and we we just um we just enjoy ourselves so much. <laughs> well, uh, people in, uh, people also enjoy um, immensely uh, the each night uh, and each of your talks. They open up the season so beautifully and, um, you know, the reassurance around hope um, is very powerful, I think, at the moment, uh, given everything that's going on, whether it be Ukraine, it doesn't matter what year, there's always conflict, there's always struggle, um, but uh, there is always hope uh, as well for the people in the Ukraine, the people, the men and women, but particularly women in Iran um, and other countries. Um, so the message of hope um, and uh, uh, we look forward to Jesus Christ's uh, arrival again um, soon. Um, and certainly we look forward to the 25th um, of December, which is coming up very quickly. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we look forward to coming back and doing it again. Yep, we'll see you next week. week. Yep. Um, safe travels and and thank you, uh, Mary, for your early morning um, efforts. We're getting lots of thank yous through the chat. Um, and uh, Yanina and Mary and Chris, thank you very much uh, again Welcome. for this evening.